right, so we've been in this series be- called Becoming Us, and we're looking at 1 Corinthians, uh, actually the two letters to the Corinthians. We're almost done with 1 Corinthians. If you've got your Bibles today, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. The Last week we started chapter 14. This week we're changing topics a little bit, and we're just going to kind of finish up that chapter. Uh, but as we studied in this series, Corinth was an ancient trade city. It had a reputation for immorality and diversity and corruption and just all kind of different beliefs and all, all kind of different things happening. And um, there were arguments within the church, like the, the group of people that were trying to come together and God was creating this community. Uh, they, were, they were having trouble kind of coalescing into one body. And so Paul writes to them to try to unify them. Do we live in an age where there's a lot of division. Yes, we do. And so this is a very, very important book for us to study and for us to read. Uh, In chapters 12 through 14, kind of where we've been, you can, uh, we've we've got everything up online now. You can catch up if you want. We studied spiritual gifts and the most important of these gifts was found in chapter 13 and that was love. Last week, we we started in chapter 14 where Paul is giving instruction to the church regarding tongues and prophecy. And we said there were two types of of prophecy. There was foretelling, that's in the future this is going to happen. But the more common that we see in the church is foretelling. And that is when we declare God's word into a situation. You can declare God's word when someone is broken, when someone is hurting, when someone is confused, when there's anxiety in their life, when they need provision. You can declare God's word in that situation, and that is a form of prophecy. We also talked about tongues, the natural tongues. What, the, what that was is in Acts chapter 2, where they act, there was a bunch of people from a bunch of different countries, a bunch of different languages gathered together, and the, the believers spoke in tongues. They spoke the gospel in the native language of everyone who could hear. So we studied that, and we also start, talked a little bit about prayer language. In 1 Corinthians 14, 5, Paul says this, Now I want all of you to speak in tongues, but even more, I want you to prophesy. This week... We're going to be in chapter 14, and we're going to learn about order in our worship gatherings. Uh, let's, let's just kind of read what uh, Paul says in, in verse 26 through 30, and this is kind of where he's wrapping up the idea of tongues and prophecies. He says this, What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. Let all things be done for, the, for building up. If anyone is, if any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or, or, or most three. So he's kind of putting a cap on how that should happen. And each in turn and let someone interpret. So if no one's there to interpret, let them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. So again, make this just about you and God. Don't make it a public thing unless there's someone there to interpret. Let two or three prophets speak. So if someone wants to declare the word of the Lord, that can happen. Two or three uh, people, let others weigh in as what it said. A revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. If a revelation is made, let the first be silent. So again, don't be talking over each other. Don't be uh, doing that. You, 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 you shouldn't be doing that. It should just be one at a time. For you all can prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirit of the prophet is subject, or the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets For God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace. What does verse 32 there mean? The spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. We, uh, at that time, there was a very dualistic view of the world. Like there there was a, 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 the, the good spirit world and there was a corrupt physical world. I'm getting a little bit of feedback. There's a corrupt physical world. But in Romans, it teaches us that, that Jesus, when the resurrection of Jesus happened, it, resur- it redeemed all of us. It talks about how the resurrection even redeems creation. For in, uh, This is Romans 8, 19. For creation waits with eager longing for the, reveal- with the, for the revealing of the sons of God. In that time, they thought that prophecy involved complete possession of the Spirit. So the, the Spirit just comes upon me and I lose total control of my words and my thoughts and my actions. I'm no longer responsible for them because it's just the Spirit working through me. However, if we actually believe this, 
then those who would speak and, and use God's, the powers of God or the, the, the methods of the Spirit, they would use these things for their own selfish ends or to manipulate others with a quote-unquote prophetic word, and they would do this for their own gain. They could easily do so because we would think that that person, as long as they're speaking on behalf of God, then they, they're just, that's, that must be what God is saying. But that's not what Paul is saying here. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, meaning that you better come humbly. You don't get to blame your errors, your missteps, your, communica- your miscommunication while speaking in the church on the spirit. The, uh, a guy, a theologian, a uh, charismatic theologian, he says this. His name's Craig Kinnear. Great guy. If you're into this and you want to read more, I really recommend this guy. Uh, inspiration can be regulated, and regulating the timing and manner of one's utterance is not the same as quenching it altogether. So we can regulate this. Don't blame the Spirit. Take responsibility and be humble. Before we go any further on in verse 34 through 40, because this is a really touchy uh, kind of passage in the Bible, and if you've, you've heard uh, if you've been in church for a while, you've probably heard this taught. You've probably heard it taught wrong maybe once or twice. Um, but we need to get a framework for interpreting Scripture. Because you and I, we have this t- uh, 2020 American worldview, and sometimes we can project this worldview onto the text. And we read the text and we're like, man, this, this doesn't make sense. Why is he saying that? Why would he say that? And, and, and it, it, it gets confusing at best and at the worst. It, the, the text just makes you angry. Um, but it, it's, it's really, we're, we're, we might not be interpreting the right way if we project our worldview on it. If something in the Bible seems weird to me, then I need to try to better understand the culture and circumstance to which it was written. I need to understand why he was saying this. Where, while there are times when modern culture gets it wrong, we need scripture and we need scripture to correct us. We also need to understand that each book of the Bible was written to a specific group of people thousands of years ago and their culture was very different than ours. There is a fantastic book outside the Bible. I recommend this as required reading for any Christian. It's called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. They're going to put a picture of it on the screen. How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. If you need something to study on top of your, your Bible and you're like, man, what do I go through? Like, what, what should I read? This is what I recommend for you. How to Read the Bible for What It's Worth by Fee and Stewart. It talks about a concept here. And one of the main points is this. A verse cannot mean something to you that it didn't mean to the original audience. I can't take my baggage and my worldview and project that onto the text. In doing so, I can change its meaning and make it say something that it's not really saying. People do this all the time. Uh, they do it with politics. They do it with all kind of things. They, they, they take what, what they believe and they go to the Bible and they say, let me find something that agrees with how I think and how I believe. And then they present that instead of saying, let me see what the Bible says and let that shape what I believe. We can't project our worldview onto the text. Uh, when reading the Bible, we, can, we have to start with the question, what did this mean to them? And then ask, what does it mean to me? We can't just start with what does this mean to me, because then we might get it wrong. We might not understand what they're meaning. On multiple occasions in Scripture, Satan twisted God's words against him, making it seem like God said something that he didn't actually say. So again, in the context of what Paul is talking about, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophet. You're going to have pastors, teachers, people on Facebook. Here's the thing about Facebook. It is a podium just like the one that I'm talking behind right now, right? It is a podium and a platform. You're going to have Christians speak and say things and even quote scripture, but unless it, if they're taking it out of context and it's changing the meaning and projecting meaning onto it that the Bible didn't intend, then that is wrong. It's wrong. We can't do that. We have to go to the Bible and say, God, God, what are you saying to these people? What are you saying to me? Not let me find something that agrees with how I think. If Satan can do this, if Satan can take God's word and twist it, can't you and I? We can. If we are, are, are um, 
misogynist, meaning that we think, you know, I'm a man and I think all women are bad, or I'm a woman and I think all men are bad, or we're racist, or we're selfish, or we're deceitful. Isn't it possible that I could project that worldview onto a passage and in doing so change the passage's meaning? Yes, it is absolutely possible. So let's get to verse 33. In, as in all churches of the saints. The women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak at church. Do you see how someone who believes wrong, who has an errant view of Scripture, who, ha- who is broken in themselves and how they view the opposite sex, could take this passage and twist it and make it agree with what they think? Very easily so. And you may have actually heard someone do that. You may have actually heard someone. But in that society, we have to understand what was really happening. And once we understand what is really happening, this is not a passage of one group having power over another or one group manipulating another. This is actually a passage of equality and of one group helping another group out. And so this is what was happening. In Corinthian society, uh, boys were educated and they were taught how to read, but girls were not. Does that seem fair? Girls, if, 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 we let, if we let Cole go to school, Maisie, but you couldn't, does that seem fair? No, it doesn't seem fair, right? But that was what was happening. Female education, if we even want to call it that, was centered around running a household. So we, bought, we taught you how to clean, we taught you how to cook, we taught you how to uh, do all the stuff that it takes to run a household, but we weren't going to teach you how to read. We weren't going to teach you what the philosophers were saying. We weren't going to teach you about math. Therefore, women by and large were excluded from any type of learning. And thankfully, our society today has moved beyond those limitations and and, and we no longer discriminate or we're no longer supposed to discriminate against uh, gender. What was actually happening in the Corinthian church is you had husbands and wives, men and women sitting side by side, learning about the Bible, learning about the scriptures, learning about the revelation of God together. And that was not normal. And so what Paul is writing is he's talking about a problem that that was actually creating, that this new kind of thing where everyone can be included, everyone should learn together, everyone should be connected together. Let's, he's like, well, let's bring some order and some structure to it so we can keep the ball moving. Let's, he's addressing a problem. And here's the problem. It's just simply this. So Liz and I, we're, we're binge-watching a Netflix show. If you guys don't know what binge-watching is, I think everyone in here does, but this is what it, this is. What it is. When I was young, kids, when I was young, I had a favorite show, and it would come out, what, one day a week, right? It would come out every Tuesday, right? And I had to wait till the next Tuesday to watch my little 30-minute episode, and then the next Tuesday, I had to watch it, and then the next Tuesday, I had to watch it, and then once the season was over, I had to wait like six months to a year to watch it again, right? You guys are older than enough in the room. You remember that? Yeah? And so, but today, it's different. Netflix completely changed the way we watch TV. It changed everything. Now, you don't sit down for 30 minutes once a week and watch it. No, what you do is you sit there and you watch episode after episode after episode after episode after episode. And typically, in one night in my household, I mean, on the short shows, we can knock out, you know, five or six episodes. On the long shows, we're knocking out two or three, right? And that's what you do. That's how you watch TV now, right? So Liz and I, we're binge watching the show. And usually, I go to sleep way before she does, like way before, or no, opposite flip that around. Liz goes to sleep way before I do. But this past week, I was going to sleep early. And, you know, what I do, now this is up for debate, and she'll she'll probably correct me later. What I do is when she goes to sleep, I'll change it and I'll watch something else so we can stay together on our episode. She she rolls her eyes and says no, right? Because that's what you're supposed to do, right? Right? That's what you're supposed to do, right? Well, when I went to sleep, she just kept watching the episode. So the next night, she picks up where she left off, right? I go to sleep early. She picks up where you left off. I have no idea what's happening in the show now. Like, I'm like completely oblivious to what's I'm like, what is going on? What, what, why is that person's arm? Why is she in a cast now? Oh, she had a car accident. Okay, that makes sense. Like, what is happening in this show? I just didn't know what was happening. I didn't have a frame of reference. And so what I had to do is I had to get a tutor who watched every episode to catch me up, right? That you guys are laughing. This doesn't just happen in my house. 
Okay, good. I'm glad it happens in every house. This is what was happening in the Corinthian church. You have to think about it this way, that the husbands were taught how to read. They were taught philosophy. They were taught all these things. The women were invited into these meetings, which is amazing. But what was happening is, is as they were, as the pastor was teaching, as someone was teaching the God's word, they would stop like every couple seconds. They'd be like, okay, wait, I have a question. Can you clarify this? Why is this person's arm broken? Like that, that type of question, you know, like, like fill in the plot holes for me. Right. And so what would happen is, is, is that this would happen so much that it would just it wouldn't move the thing forward. Now, imagine if we're all watching the same show together. Right. If we're we're binge watching the show together and we gather here on Sundays and, and every husband in the room didn't know the show, but every wife in the room had 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 seen the show. Right. And then we're having the wives trying to catch up the husbands. Right. Do you guys ever do that? You, you, I have no idea, what's go, no idea what's going on. I'm going to ask a bunch of questions, right? And so that was what was happening. So it was just a lot of disorder. And that is why he tells the wives in this passage to be quiet and to ask the husband's questions at home. The issue he was, he was addressing was a weakness in education, thankfully, that a society has now addressed, not in gender. This weakness was a due to a flaw in the society, not in the innate qualities of one gender over another. Let husbands, he's saying, act as tutors to catch your wives up. So now we both can study the Bible in today's age. We both can study the Bible. We can both can study scripture. We both can have revelation from God. We both can speak. The, and, and speak God's, God's truth. We both can do those things, and, and that's important. And so uh, Keener says one more thing. He says, informed listeners customarily ask questions during the lectures, but it was considered rude for the ignorant to do so. So if you didn't know what was going on, don't ask any questions. That's considered rude. Although by modern standards, literacy was generally low in this society, women were far less trained in Scripture and public reasoning than men were. Paul does not expect these uneducated women to refrain from learning, indeed, that most of their culture kept them from from learning. That was a problem. Instead, he provides the most progressive model for his day to let their husbands uh, respect their intellectual capabilities enough to give them private instruction. He wants them to stop interrupting the teaching period of the service, however, because until they know more, they're distracting everyone and they're disrupting the church order. They're disrupting each other. This passage is not giving men license to be misogynistic. Rather, it's a charge to them to provide on-ramps for those who society has left behind. This is not a passage to where one group can say that they are better, smarter, more equipped, more spiritual than the other. This is a passage for the the group that has had the benefits of society to reach out and to minister and to catch up and to provide on-ramps to include those who society has left out. Think about the whole context of chapter 14 and what he's saying for a moment. We need a prophetic voice in the church. Tongues are good, but tongues can leave people behind without interpretation. Knowledge is good, but what do we do for those who society has left behind? Verse 39. So my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. All of this, I'm going to close with this today, all of this raises a question for us. What is our responsibility to those who society has left behind? It is very easy for you and I to sit in our privilege, and whenever I say privilege, I'm talking about your education, your background, your, the, what, you, what, you, what you've been blessed with in life the opportunities that you've been given, that's been provided to you. It's very easy for me to sit in that and judge someone who does not have those same opportunities and think that they should just be on the same level as me. 
If they only worked harder or they were smarter or they had, you know, if they had my work ethic, if they had my thing. No, no, no. We should not do that. That's not the model that Paul is teaching here. What he's saying is that we have a responsibility to those who society has left behind. We do not sit in our pride and think, well, if they worked as hard as I do or studied as hard as I do. No, no. In the context of the kingdom of God, is there anything that any of us truly deserve? No. There's nothing that we truly deserve. We all receive grace. That's unmerited favor from God. So it is our responsibility to live in a humble appreciation of that grace and turn around and reach back to those who need help, who need to be caught up, who need assistance, who need grace, and pull them along with us to minister to them and give them opportunity. That is ministry in its truest form. Turning back and helping other people through. I couldn't minister to parents who had miscarriages until I experienced that. Liz and I experienced that myself. Now we do it in a whole different way. I understand what they're going through. I understand what they're feeling. I, under, I feel it in a whole different way. Hebrews teaches us that, that Jesus became human so he could sympathize with our weaknesses. Compassion, empathy, and grace should be the hallmarks of a believer because that was given to us. Paul's instruction here is to help others along. Reach back. Find someone who's broken. Find someone who, who society has left behind. Find someone who's not had the opportunities that you've had. Find someone and pull them along. Bring them along. Make them part of what you're doing. Minister to them. Love on them. Help them become all that God has for them to be. This is an invitation, not of exclusion. It's an invitation of inclusion. But the problem is, is that the devil has let people twist it and make it a message of exclusion. We have to know what God is saying to us and hear what God is saying and not just make it about us.